morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Wellsprings. I am Sid. This is my really, really good friend, Mr. Keith Cooley. How you doing, Keith? I'm doing great. I'm so glad. We need to get into this. We have a new series starting. We do? For better or worse, about relationships. And I just have to be honest. They, Trey asked us to do this series because he knows what good husbands and fathers we, we, we are. are. We are. We just yes, can't sir. commit to four weeks. So we hope it's going to be awesome. Yes. And we're going to give him some cues after each week. But first, right. I want to I congratulate you. Really? On being okay. such an amazing husband, father, and everything. Joe wow. tells me she's so blessed because when y'all get in arguments, right. your communication is wonderful. Yeah. You just diffuse everything. So I'm going to give you this. It is the GOAT. Oh my. You are the greatest, my Look friend. Look at this. Look at this. Yes. Wait, wait, stop clapping. What? It says G-H-O-A-T. Dude, Go- greatest husband of all uh, time, man. Look at here, dog. <laughs> I appreciate you, man. I'm just, hey, listen. Joe's the lucky one. Yeah, she is. I she mean. is. She, but listen. Yes. I, I, we, we're on the same page here because I was thinking the same thing. I'm going to give my friend something to celebrate him as a husband. Stop. And I thought, go big or go home. Oh, That's what really? I said. Bring it out, please. Wow. That's amazing. Oh, it's, it, it said it was much bigger online. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. What, 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 what are you doing, doing up here? Go. Bro, go we're stage, done with man. you. Go. This is our stage. Man, just like his dad, always trying to get all the FaceTime. Like, oh, here, look. I want to preach up here, yeah. Hey, you know what? what? Enough about us. Okay, true. It's time for them to hear from the experts. What? what? The ones that we work for, yes, the ones is. that we love, yes. they love us. They're going to give you a short, a very short, short description clip. of what it's like to be married. Yes, short clip. Husband. Roll the short yeah. clip. Good morning. I am Emily Cooley, and I am actually Keith's wife. And I'm Joe, said's better half. And we were forced to be... We were asked to be here to share a little bit about what makes our husbands so wonderful. And they are wonderful. We love them very much. And because we love them, we want to help them out a little bit. So, guys, Keith, Cedric, you guys can go on and get off the stage now. You're not needed today. We will take it from here. We are actually going to stick to the time, to a script, to the schedule. And we're going to start the clock right now. And said, you're a really smart guy. Like, you communicate well with the Wellspring students on Wednesday nights. You're working through your PhD, for goodness sake. But something doesn't quite click on stage Sunday mornings. If you're new here, what typically happens when these two do the welcome is some kind-hearted soul reluctantly gives them microphones. They come on stage and said is really confused about everything, actually. And Keith tries to set him straight. Which is funny, because Keith is always confused. Speaking of being here for the first time, if today is your first time, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. If you will fill out the connection card in the seat back in front of you, or scan that QR code, we would love the opportunity to get to talk with you. Or if you'd rather chat with someone in person, we invite you to our blue room, which is to the left, just off our lobby, after the message today. And for everyone joining us online, welcome. Your host is gonna drop a link in the chat. You can click on that to access our digital connection card so we can get to know you a little bit more. You know guys, speaking of online, um, you do realize that every week, these are videotaped and pictures are taken. And every week you have some kind of interesting costume on. Every week you seem to push it a little bit further. Like, at what cost? Your bosses, the people that work with you, they're all seeing these. Have you thought about that? And with the jokes, guys, it's time to spruce up the four that you regularly keep in rotation. You know, Pastor Trey makes Keith sleepy. Ha ha. Student Pastor Eric takes too long introducing the worship. Worship Pastor TJ's. His jeans are... Okay, those jeans are quite skinny, but you guys are a little bit obsessed over it. And said, I cannot hear Waymaker with the Jamaican accent one more time. You're from Kansas, babe. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. The point is, we love you guys, and we want other people to be able to see what amazing, awesome, loving people you really are, for better or worse. This series is gonna help us have candid conversations about our relationships, and how to be honest with each other all the time. Yeah, so everyone stand up. Say hello to a couple of people around you, and let's get started. Hey, guys. We nailed it. Yeah, we did. Good morning. How you doing after this one? Let's put our hands together, come on. Hurry, so hallelujah. 
in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is melody and I raise a hallelujah and heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna say
You clothed me and got me to praise Jesus forever My song will be you hey, hey. I'm living in freedom You take Let's just lift this with our hearts. Let's sing this to God. That is overwhelming love for us. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Let's sing this out. Don't 
Well, good morning. 
I'm glad you guys are here. If you're a guest today, uh, my name is Trey Kelly, lead pastor here. Thank you. And we're honored that you're here. We thank you for if you're joining us in the room. Thank you if you're joining us online. Um, I want to start today by testing out a theory, all right? And I'm going to put some pictures on the screen of, of movies. I'll go ahead and tell you that they're movies. I'm going to put just pictures on the screen of movies. And when you know what movie it is, I want you to yell out. Like, I want you to start. No, no fear, no shame. This should be easy. But when you know the movie, all right, I want you to yell out. Okay, let's go ahead and put the first one up. I didn't say woo. We just talked about this. We literally just talked. I said, I want to test a theory. When I show a movie, yell it out. I put the movie up. Woo! It's too late now. My theory was proven. I'm kidding. All right, all right. Go to the next one. Nope. You've got mail. Oh, oh, yeah, they've been in a lot of movies together. All right, show me the next one. Yeah, see, you guys were one slide ahead. You didn't know. All right, go to the next one. Notting Hill. All right, last one. Sleepers in Seattle. Okay, 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 go ahead, go ahead, get, get rid of the slide. Okay, so you proved my theory. You guys really dig Julia Roberts and Meg Ryan. Those movies are old. To the young ones in the room, you should, actually, no, you shouldn't watch those movies. I'm not recommending those movies. That's always a horrible idea. I'm not endorsing those movies. I'm not recommending those movies. You just knew them. So that's really on you. I'm just kidding. Now, put those up on the screen because the reason people watch those movies, the reason people love those movies, the reason people go back to those movies is because without saying it, those movies promise us something. Because if you've ever seen any of those movies, not that I have, if you've ever seen any of those movies, you may remember they all sort of end the same way. Two lost souls moving towards each other. There's a conflict. And then at the end, they work it out. And the credits roll. And the implication is that they live happily ever after. And sometimes we go to those movies because we need the hope of happily ever after. In fact, if I were to ask you today what you think about the phrase happily ever after, is it, is it possible? I bet your answer would depend on your relationship status. <laughs> if you have no relationship status, your thought is it better be possible. I hope it's possible. If you have a new relationship status, you're like, of course it's possible. I'm living it. They're perfect. They complete me. (laughs) Or if you have a normal relationship status, you're like, depends on the day, man. (laughs) Depends on the day. Sometimes it's, yeah, yeah, we definitely had it at one point. We have it in spurts. So is happily ever after possible? We'd all probably begrudgingly say, I guess it's possible. Is it probable? I think if we're honest, most of us would say, man, I I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. And it's because we all live in the same world. We all, we all understand the same reality. You, you have the friends I do. Your kids are in school. You, you've, you've experienced it. You know as well as I do the stat that's thrown around about marriage. There's a 50% divorce rate. Now, there's some debate as to whether or not that's actually correct, but anecdotally, we, it sounds about right. We all have kids that are in school that are on soccer teams and and cheer teams and baseball teams, and and, and we know that just about every family that we encounter, happily ever after didn't happen. Some of you in the room, you lived it yourself. We know this. 
is true. We don't ever really stop and think of why. Let me, let me give you just some opinions I have as to why that's true. Why happily ever after doesn't happen near as often as we think it should, especially when we jump in to the relationship. Because the reason we jump in is because we assume happily ever after is going to happen. Most of the reasons aren't really our fault. Because the vast majority of us, we didn't grow up with healthy relational models. We, we, we didn't see what a healthy marriage looked like. Also, most of us are, may I be so bold, pretty emotionally unhealthy, if we can admit it. You know, I didn't say mentally unhealthy because I didn't want to offend you, but you are. <laughs> And we don't know what to do with those mental and emotional deficits. And so we take it out on our spouse. Also, most of us live in a culture, we grew up in an environment where there's a pretty low tolerance for relational pain. We don't really have a high pain tolerance. Um, And most people also believe in what I call the right person myth. Like, if I could just find the right person, then, you know, everything would just, be, would just be fantastic. Which, if that were the case, you would think second marriages would be more successful than the first. But uh, I already got a laugh, yeah, because you know where I'm going. You know what the divorce rate is of second marriages? It's 67%. You know what the divorce rate is of third marriages? 73%. That's some terrible picking, folks. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Well, obviously, it's because today we're beginning a brand new series. It's a series on marriage. And we're calling the series For Better or Worse. Now, I love that, I love that title because if you are married in the room, if you've ever been to a wedding, you, you're familiar with the phrase. If, if, if you're married today, odds are you said that phrase. Or you at least said I do to that phrase at your wedding. Which means you, you well, I guess technically you, you vowed it. You made a vow. We all made a vow. And we all made the vow when better seemed way more probable than worse. But I've been married almost 20 years now, and here's what I've discovered. The better we get at loving our spouse in their worst moments, the likelier happily ever after becomes. So what we are going to do for for the next few weeks is we're going to learn, if you're married today, how to become that spouse. Which means if you're married, the series is for you. If you are a teenager, if you're a college student, the series is for you. Because as you're going to see hopefully through this series, what we bring to marriage more than anything else, more than who you pick, more than your compatibility, your compatibility, what we bring to marriage makes the difference in the success or failure of that marriage. And so wherever you are in your relational journey, if, if, if you are considering marriage, if you've been married and you're like, you know what, I'm going back to that, that's fine. You don't know what God's going to do in your life. See, I actually think this series is universal. I think this series is going to help everybody in the room, whether you're married or not, but, but, but it is specifically for, for married folks. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, we got a lot of content to cover over the next few weeks. Uh, there's no way I can cover every marital issue, every marital struggle, every marital strife. I can't do that. And so what we're going to do is when this series is over, we're going to begin small groups out of this series, specifically for married couples and for engaged couples who, who maybe want to spend some more time Uh, working on it and talking on it and and have questions about it. Also, every week of our series, we're going to have people in the blue room uh, specifically there for for you because there's a really good chance some issues are going to come up in this series. Some some, some things are going to come up and you're going to want help. You're going to want to talk to somebody. We have resources in the blue room for you to connect you with with great counselors uh, that we know and that we we approve of. Um, And so that's going to be on the table as well. Uh, And one, One last quick thing before we get started. Because it's really important to say this, because I know in a room, 
like this, watching online, when I bring up marriage, when I say for better or worse, I know there are people in this room who that phrase, for better or worse, it still hurts because you live the worst. You got the worst. Marriage hurt you. And you're still hurting from it. And here you are in a church and we're talking about, about marriage and I, I, I know I can feel disconnected. And so let me just go and address something right at the top because I know in a church, I know divorce is a touchy topic and people don't know how they feel about it and people don't understand and, and there can be judgment and some condemnation or you can feel judgment and condemnation because of what you tell yourself. So let me just make a couple of things incredibly clear right at the top, okay? Divorce was never part of God's plan for marriage. It just wasn't. But, but, neither was sin. And sin breaks things. And so if there was sin in your marriage, sin God never intended, adultery, abuse, abandonment, I need you to know God didn't intend that. Now, I stand here on this stage telling you, I have seen God do miraculous things in marriage where those sins exist. Our Savior can raise the dead. He can certainly heal a marriage. So that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is this. In every single one of those miraculous things I've seen, there were two willing participants. Marital miracles take two people. And so if you find yourself here today brokenhearted, because another person didn't want the miracle? I need you to know your heavenly father does not and will not ever hold you accountable for the choices of other people. Because you can't control other people. So if that's you today, I hope you feel freedom. I hope you feel grace. I hope you feel released to move into whatever God has for your life because living your life controlled by someone else's choices is not a thing your heavenly father ever intended for you or for me or for any of us. In fact, I believe one of the major misunderstandings we have in marriage, probably the number one reason for divorce in marriage is because we misunderstand whose responsibility and whose job it is to do the work in a marriage. And in fact, that's where I want us to start today. We're going to start with a topic. I'm just going to tell you right now it has a terrible name. I wish I could have named it something better, but we'll get there together, I promise. Most of us, the vast majority of us, have a misunderstanding when it comes to marriage. We fundamentally misunderstand how it works because we fundamentally misunderstand a text that if you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard. If you've ever been around a wedding, you, 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 maybe it was even read over you. Uh, it's a text that we first find in the book of Genesis when, 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 when God, our, our Heavenly Father, is describing creation. Uh, it's a text Jesus himself quotes when he talks about marriage. Uh, it, it's a text Paul refers to in his letter to the Ephesians. And so I want to take you to that, to that text right now because here's what we misunderstand. Paul says, as the scriptures say, again, as, as God said in the Old Testament, as Jesus said in the New Testament, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Two people into one. See, I think this is what we misunderstand. What we misunderstand is something that I'm calling the math of marriage. Again, terrible title. I understand that. But we'll get there together, okay? All right? We misunderstand the math of marriage because if you read that verse, it's easy to think the math of marriage looks like this. One plus one equals one. Two into one. One plus one equals one. Now, I haven't taken math since high school. I was a liberal arts major in college. But even my math skills tell me one 
plus one equals two. It does not equal one. But let's go back and read the verse again. Because the verse clearly says a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. So it sure sounds like the math of marriage is one plus one equals one. And that drives me crazy because it's not right. (laughs) One plus one equals two. But Paul understands this because Paul adds this. He says, this is a great mystery. You better believe it's a mystery, Paul. (laughs) Because for the totality of human existence, one plus one is equal to two. But we think one plus one equals one. But it's because we misunderstand the math. Paul explains. He says, this is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. Now, don't miss that. Paul is saying... When a husband and wife are united as one in marriage, when two become one, one plus one equals one is what we think it is. He's saying this is a picture. This is an illustration. This mirrors what happens when Jesus and the church, Jesus and me, Jesus and you, when we become one. Now, I don't know about you, but if you consider yourself a Christian, you've probably experienced this. Jesus did a whole lot more than add to my life. He didn't take me, clean me up a little bit, add a little Jesus to it, and say, let's go. (laughs) Some days it feels that way, but it's not what he did. Jesus doesn't add to my life. Jesus multiplies my life. Jesus does infinitely more than I can ask or imagine in my life. Life. Let me, let, me show you, let me show you what I mean. Okay, go back. This is what we think the math of marriage looks like. One plus one equals one. That doesn't make sense. And what Paul just revealed is it shouldn't make sense because this is incorrect. One plus one does not equal one. You know what does equal one? One times one. One times one equals one. One. For the 10 people in the room, how relieved are you the math works now? You're like, oh, thank goodness. Now see, my relationship with Jesus isn't him just adding to me. It's him changing me. It's him multiplying me. It's him creating a new creation, a new person in math terms, a new product. That's what happened. In, 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 in my relationship with Jesus. I'm not the sum of me and Jesus. Thank goodness. I am multiplied into something new. Now, again, for the 10 people who cared about the math, you really believe the math works. For the rest of you, you're like, bro, what is your point? Great question. When we misunderstand the math of marriage, we make a fundamental mistake. Because this is how, if we're honest, we actually think about marriage. We don't think one plus one equals one. What we think is half plus half equals one. You know how I know? That's why you call your spouse your better half. I'm not knocking you. That's what we do. We fundamentally believe the goal of marriage is to find the other half to make us whole. To find the person that completes us. That's what we've been taught. To find the person that can smooth out the rough edges. To find the person that can fix our brokenness. That's what we think the goal of marriage is. To find that one in a generation person who if I can just add them to my life, I take my half, they take their half, we put them together, we're one whole person. We balance each other out. We give each other purpose. We give each other meaning. All these glorious things we say about marriage. Things we feel like are so good to say and so kind and so loving. But what we don't get 
is we've misunderstood the math. Half plus half equals a whole. That's true. But addition is not the math of marriage. We've already talked about that. And here's another thing we as adults need to understand. Teenagers, you can understand this as well. I'd love for you to give in to this truth. It doesn't matter what we think is true. It matters what is true. We can think all day long the math of marriage is addition. And we need to have a half, and we need to find somebody else's half, and we need to bring them together to make us whole, to make us complete. We just need to find that right person that fits, that solves, that makes things easier. We can think that all day long. It doesn't change the facts. It doesn't change the math. We think it's addition. Jesus has told us is multiplication. Now, how many of you remember, I guess this was middle school, what happens when you multiply decimals? Anybody remember? What happens when you do 0.5 times 0.5? Are you in, do you end up with something whole? Do you end up with something better? Or do you actually end up with something worse? This is the number one reason for divorce in the world. And you're like, that's a, that's a math equation. Yeah, but let me understand. Let me explain it to you. When we bring a half, and we go looking for somebody else to bring their half, and we think they're going to make us whole, what actually ends up happening is we end up with less than we started with. And we blame them for it. We came to marriage insecure. We thought we married someone that was going to solve our insecurity and make us whole. And in fact, they make it worse. We came to marriage looking for someone who was going to make us feel safe who's going to make us feel secure, who's going to smooth out our rough edges, when in reality, they're getting worse. And don't tell them, but their deficits are getting worse too. And we're confused because we were supposed to find a half and we were supposed to unite with another half and the two halves were supposed to come together to make a whole. Because that's what we've been taught. That's what we've been told. That's what we've been sold. Find the person that completes you. And so we try and we try and we try and we count on them to make us feel whole. We count on them to make us feel safe. We count on them to solve our temper issues. We count on them to teach us how to manage money. We count on them for all these things and it doesn't work. And we're certainly not going to blame ourselves. So who do we blame? Them. You are the problem. Because you, what do we say? What do we say? Don't make me happy anymore. Like another human can make us happy. So we blame each other. We blame our circumstances. We blame our careers. We blame the fact we don't have enough money. We blame the fact we have too much money. We don't have enough kids. We have too many kids. <laughs> we just misunderstood the math. We thought we were looking for someone to add to our lives to make us whole. When Jesus very clearly says, no, 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 no. The math of marriage is an addition. It's multiplication. And here's why not understanding that is so damaging. Okay? Some of us begin to understand, you know what? They can't fix everything in me. They can't solve everything in me. So I'm going to take some steps and maybe they'll pick up the rest. Okay? And so we work on ourselves. We bring a little bit, but we still expect them to add to. We still expect them to fill the deficits in our soul, our emotional deficits. And so let's say you work really hard, okay, and you would consider yourself, I'm not a 0.5 person anymore. I'm a 0.75 person now, and they're a 0.7 person, 0.7. You know what happens? When you multiply 0 0.75, 0 0.75, you still get less. Now, let's say you are a world-class achiever. I mean, like, you get it done, all right? You get up at 4 a.m. You have worked out by 5 a.m. You read your Bible for an hour, 
I mean, you do everything, and all you need, you just need 10% from them. Man, I'll bring 90. I'll bring 90. They bring 10. I, only, I just need this one thing. This one thing I need from them. I got 90%. I'm doing it, man. Look at all I'm doing. I just need 10%. You know what happens? We're still adding, adding decimals, multiplying them. You still get less. There's literally no number you can get to in your life, in your marriage, that another person can make you whole. That another person can complete you. And if that's what you're waiting for, if you're waiting on them to step up and fix a deficit to solve a problem in you, it's never going to work. Because we don't understand the math. It's not up for debate. It's not an argument. It's logic. The math of marriage is the math of marriage. It's what Jesus said. It's one times one equals one. Which means the goal of my life and the goal of your life when it comes to marriage is to bring a whole person to it. Not expect them to make us whole. That's the only way the math works. One times one equals one. You get that, right? Anything less than one times anything less than one will end up with less. And so the goal of marriage, for me, for you, for all of us, and we miss this, we're going to talk about this for the next few weeks. The goal of marriage is to wrestle with the idea of wholeness, the idea of completeness, the idea of what does it mean to be a full, whole person? What does it mean to have my emotional needs met? What does it mean to have the deficits in me that have been there for decades? What does it mean to take steps to become whole? That's what we're going to wrestle with for the next few weeks because here's the reality about marriage. Here's the thing I promise. If you get and I get and we all get happily ever after becomes a lot more probable. This is completeness. It's something we bring to, not expect from, our marriage. It's just a fact. They can't complete us. They can't fix us. They can't solve and fill and cure the deficits of our soul. That is on us. And so the next logical question is, well, that sounds overwhelming. You're saying this is all on me? Yeah. But you don't have to do it alone. That's the beauty of our relationship with Jesus. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we become whole? How do we bring completeness to our marriage? How do we bring a whole person to it rather than expecting it to make us whole? How do we do that? Well, again, that, that's the point of this entire series. It's what we're going to spend weeks talking about. But the answer at its core is incredibly simple. And in fact, we've already read it. I'm going to read it to you one more time. Because the answer is this. Even though it's a great mystery... Marriage is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. See, that desire we have for completeness, that desire we have for wholeness, that desire we have to have the deficits of our heart filled is a very healthy desire. It is a God-given desire. And God himself is the only one that can meet that desire. That's what Paul's saying. When Jesus and the church are united, when we unite ourselves with Jesus, we become one. Not a fraction of one, not half of one, not 75% of one. We become one, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus does in us. 
because he is the one who heals our hurts. He is the one that provides the security we need. He is the one that can provide the safety we need, the confidence we need. He is the one that can help us reign in our temper. He is the one that can teach us self-control. He is the one that gives love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He is the one who does those things. And so when Paul says, hey, 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 the way you become one in marriage is a picture of the way you and Jesus became one, that should instantly start the clock and turn the light on for all of us. Because I don't go to Jesus and say, hey, bro, what can I offer you today? That's not how it works. Jesus gives himself to me and says, trust me and I'll change your life. So if you consider yourself a Christian, you've experienced that. And if you actually read any of the verses about marriage written in both the Old and the New Testament, when it talks about how marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church, I know we all want to be the church. But if you read the illustrations in marriage, you know who we're called to be? We're called to be Jesus. He's the standard. We're to love like Jesus. We're to serve like Jesus. We're to forgive like Jesus. And again, Jesus has never asked me to cure a deficit of his in his life. (laughs) And so what's happening here? What Paul is trying to teach us, and I hope what we're all kind of taking a step back and going, you know what, I've never thought about it this way before. I never thought, yeah. Yeah, I really, I do. I get frustrated. Yeah, I get frustrated because they're not covering for my faults. I get, I get, I get frustrated that they're not fixing my flaws. Like, I get frustrated. They know this is me. They, why aren't they stepping up? Why aren't they? Why am I not getting better? I thought love cures all. One movie says love means never having to say you're sorry. That's just dumb. <laughs> what? Huh? Must have been love for 10 seconds. Because by 11 seconds, my bad. (laughs) No, 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 no. You want to change your marriage right now? You want to take it to the next level? Embrace this truth. If I want to be a whole person in my marriage, I must unite myself with the one that makes me whole. That's it. Now that is easy to say. (laughs) And it takes a lifetime to master. But when we each embrace that, you know what happens? The math, it works. When you've got one person going to Jesus, Jesus complete me. Jesus fill me up. Jesus, make me whole so I can pour out your love on my spouse. And then you got another spouse saying, Jesus, fill me up. Jesus, make me whole. Jesus, calm my insecurities. Jesus, heal my fears. Jesus, heal my hurts. Fill me up. Make me whole so I can pour out your love on my spouse. That's how God intended it to work. One whole person in Jesus and one whole person in Jesus combining, multiplying to create one world-changing unit to raise children, to change communities, to change the world. And we miss it. I miss it. You miss it. We all miss it. Because we don't understand the math. We're looking for somebody to add to. When Jesus says, no, 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 no. Your job's to pour in. Your job's to fill up. You get me. You unite with me. And I'll take care of everything else. But we'll never.
never get there. We'll never understand that's true. We'll never be able to apply this in our lives. We'll never be able to apply this in our marriages. And oh, by the way, this also goes for your children. This goes for your friends. This goes for your bosses. This goes for your grandmothers. This goes for your parents. This goes for your brothers and for your sisters. This goes for every relationship you have on earth. We're just talking about marriage. But this is a universal truth. So let's repeat it. Completeness is something we bring to, not expect from, our marriage. Let's have some fun here. Or our future marriage. Or our kids. Or our career. Or our neighbor. Or our friends. Make no mistake, we all have deficits. We all desperately need to be made complete. And we have a Savior who died and came back to life to make that possible. And when we attach that God-given desire to anything other than our God-equipped Savior, we doom ourselves and whoever we attach it to, to failure. So as I said, we got a lot to cover in this series. This is just the intro. Hopefully gets you thinking, gets you having conversations this week. So I want to add one more thing. Because here's what I want you to wrestle with this week. I want you to wrestle by yourself or with your spouse. But you really need to both be in good moods to do this. So fill it out. All right. You still want to be wise. Ask yourself. Ask Jesus to join you. Are there areas where you've gotten the math wrong? Is there any bitterness? Is there any frustration? Is there any anger you're carrying towards your spouse because you were thinking addition instead of multiplication? And maybe it goes deep. Maybe you've been mad for years because you really thought they were the ones that were going to fix that problem. They were going to solve it. They were going to make you confident. They were going to cure that anxiety. And they didn't. And you've been mad for years. This week, you get to lay that down. You get to say, hey, I misunderstood the math. Don't you like how I gave you math to blame instead of yourselves? You're welcome. I misunderstood. Have some conversations this week. Come back next week. Because next week we're going to pick up. Okay, if completeness is what I bring to marriage, how do we do that? How do we become complete and whole? Because we're not taught how to do that. And between now and then, I want to challenge you to pray this prayer. Hey, Jesus, make me whole so I can bring my whole self to my marriage. And again, you can add future marriage to this if you'd like. It is never too early to begin praying for wholeness. It is never too early to be praying for your Heavenly Father to teach you how to live on a day-to-day basis fully and completely filled up by Him. Safe, secure in Him so that then you can be the friend, the family member, the neighbor, the co-worker, the spouse that we were created to be. Jesus, make me whole. Jesus, make me whole. Not my spouse, not my parents. Jesus, Jesus, you alone can make me whole. Pray that this week. Invite him in. And then join us next week as we continue to learn how to bring wholeness to our marriage. Why? Because it makes the better a lot better and it makes the worse a lot less. And even in the worst moments, the more whole we are, the better we love. 
Let me pray. Father, we love you so much. And, uh, man, we're just we're thankful for you. We're, we're just so grateful oh, that you give us a picture. You give us a path. Father, I pray today that you, you give us a moment of quiet reflection, all of us in the room that are married. Oh, Father, just show us. Show us the areas. Show us the deficits. Show us the places in our soul we've been blaming our spouse for for years that we've been frustrated by, we've been confused by. Oh, God, just give us the relief. You know what? We just got the math wrong. But, Father, don't let us stop there. Once we spot the mistake, give us the steps to correct it. Give us the ability to confess. Give us the ability to repent. And, Father, show us the path to becoming whole, healthy, complete people in you so that that is what we bring to our spouse. We love you. We thank you. See you on Sunday we pray. Amen. What a great start to this series. We hope that you will join us over these next few weeks. And uh, as Trey said, if you are looking for marriage resources, if you're looking for someone to talk to, I would encourage you, stop by the Blue Room. We've got some resources for you there. We've got a team of people in that room that want to connect with you. So take that step today. You know, we want to provide these resources for you because we believe that God wants what's best for every single one of us. And we celebrate every single week uh, that truth in a special giving moment. Hey, Wellspring, it's time to give our offering. We do celebrate an opportunity to give back because as uh, we know that God wants what's best for us. And we're excited to give back a portion of what he's given back to him because he has blessed us with so many things. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you today for this message. Lord, help us to evaluate our lives this week. Help us to uh, just rely on you for everything we need to make our relationships work. Help us to, to think through what you're calling us to do, what steps we need to take. Thank you for this opportunity to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. As the buckets pass, I want to give you another reminder. Uh, even if it's your first time or you've been here 101 times, there's always a step that you can take. Uh, and I want to encourage you, whether that be to, to join a volunteer team, to join a group, to reach out for prayer, to reach out to have a conversation about marriage. We want to help you take that step. You hear this a lot, but in the seat back in front of you, there is a QR code. It says, we're glad you're here. Scan me. Scan that. Take a step. It'll take you to a connection card. Fill that out. We would love to follow up with you to help you do that. Well, thanks so much for being here today. Uh, if you will, stand to your feet, and we're going to sing one more time.
sure I have doesn't sum you up. It couldn't sum you up. Whatever picture I have isn't big enough. Whatever picture I have isn't good enough. Whatever picture I have couldn't sum you up. It couldn't sum. 